Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good in the middle of the night, whenever it is that you decided to explore the world of hypothesis testing. Um, I haven't been sitting out in the sun too long and had heat stroke, um, but I want you all to think of hypothesis testing, at least in terms of how you set up your null and alternative. I want you to keep in, your, in the back of your mind the idea that hypothesis testing is like a pair of flip-flops. Remember, I live at the beach, so I have everyday flip-flops. I even have dressy flip-flops. So hypothesis testing is a lot like a pair of flip-flops. And I'm going to show you what I mean, hopefully at the end of these 14 or 15 minutes, a light bulb is going to go on and you're going to go, hey, she's not crazy. She's right. So let's see. Um, where I'm going with this bizarre analogy. All right. Here, what I've given you is a set of, or several hypotheses. Now, the first thing that you need to know is that you really only have three options for hypothesis tests. You can have a hypothesis that looks like this. You can have one that looks like this or you can have one that looks like this. In the big scheme of life, there are only three options. And the reason that I told you that hypotheses, setting up a pair of hypotheses, is like a pair of flip-flops, is there are two hard and fast rules about a null and alternative. Remember, null is our HO, Alternative is our HA, meaning null, meaning, hey, that's the way things are. Alternative being the idea that, you know, you're telling me that the world looks like something. I have an alternative view of that. Um, I have some data or some information that may make me right and you wrong. So. When I look at these null and alternative hypotheses, and I think back to my flip-flops, what I have to do is I have to make certain that my null and alternative meet two rules. One, they have to be mutually exclusive. Okay? Mutually exclusive. That means they can't overlap. Um, the left shoe fits on my left foot, right shoe fits on my right foot, I can't wear both shoes on one foot, can't wear both shoes on the other foot. So now look at these mathematical symbols in your null and alternative. This one says less than or equal to. Well, the only thing left after I go less than or equal to is greater than. Over here, when I say my null is greater than or equal to, the only thing that's left is less than. In other words, they're mutually exclusive. This null hypothesis right here says the mean is greater than or equal to 67. Well, the only thing that leaves me is that the mean is less than 67. Well, that means that on one foot I have my left shoe, one shoe foot I have my right shoe. So we know that they have to be comprehensive. If I look down here at the way that these are constructed, my alternative says the mean is everything that's greater than 67. Well, if that takes up everything that's greater than 67, then the only thing that's left up here is for it to be equal to, and what we know, even though it's not there, is less than. Over here, when I say my alternative is the mean is less than 67, well, the only thing that's left is for it to either be equal to 67 or greater than 67. What makes people a little crazy, but hey, that's statistics, is this set of hypotheses says exactly the same thing as this. Most researchers prefer to use this notation. 
mu equals because we just presume that because this takes care of everything that's greater than 67, we now know by default that what that null hypothesis up here takes care of is everything that is less than or equal to 67. Again, it's non-overlapping and comprehensive. Well, think back to my flip-flops. I've got one on my left foot, one on my right foot. I don't have any feet left. I've covered all bases. Everything is covered. They're a matched set. They're a matched pair. Um, one goes on the left foot, one goes on the right foot. So, when you set up your null and alternative, remember that you can always guarantee, always guarantee that your null hypothesis is always going to have some form of equal to. That one is less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, one there, one there. So, they are, mute, they are overlapping and, or non-overlapping and comprehensive. I have my null flip-flop on one foot. I have my alternative flip-flop on the other. They cover all my bases. I'm not clomping around with one foot uh, without a shoe on it. The other hard and fast rule that you can take to the bank is that your alternative hypothesis is never going to have an equal sign in it. See any equal signs here? I don't. I don't see any equal signs in these alternatives. This one is really no equal sign. This alternative is saying mu is not equal to 67. So, what do we know? Now we know that all of the pair of hypotheses, um, because they're always going to come in pairs, just like my flip-flops, I know that they are going to be comprehensive, they're going to cover all my bases, and they're not going to overlap. And, in summary, I also know that my null, which is the situation as it is, will always have some version of an equal sign in it, my alternative is never going to have an equal sign in it. So, setting up your null and alternative hypotheses, if you put these down, write these down on a sheet of paper someplace, these are the only choices you have. They're either going to look like this, like this, or like this. Now, the parameter may change. You may be hypothesizing about the mean, about the variance, about the proportion, but whether you're doing variances, proportions, or means, this part of the formula, the, these hard and fast rules will apply to every parameter that you test um, with a pair of null and alternative hypotheses. So. The next big question that I get a lot is, how do I know if I have a one-tailed test, a two-tailed test, and if I've got a two-tailed test, where do I put my stuff, and if I have a one-tailed test, where do I put my stuff, because after this, you all are now the kings and queens of setting up these null and alternatives. So, let me show you the way that I've always used, and I think most people use, to determine whether we're talking one tail or two tail test. Hang on, let me get rid of this junk and um, be back, be right back with you. Okay, let's take a look. I'm going to start with the easy one. I'm going to start with this pair of hypotheses right here. This one says the null says the mu is equal to 67. The alternative says I don't know what the mu is. I don't know what the mean is. It could be bigger, could be smaller. I'm not exactly certain if it's bigger or smaller, but one thing I can tell you is I don't believe you that it is 67. Well, if I'm just telling you that it isn't equal to it, then it figures that I have two choices. My data may show that it's larger or smaller. Well, if it's larger, I'm going to come up here to my upper side of the curve and have a rejection region. If it ends up at smaller, 
it's going to come down here in this lower rejection region. This pair of hypotheses right here is always two tails. And because it's two tails, I've got two rejection regions. I've got one up here in the positive end of the curve. I've got one down here in the negative end of the curve. So I could end up with this being a positive 1.96, depending upon my level of confidence, which I would know down here would be my negative 1.96. Because remember, in a two-tailed test, what we end up doing is we take our alpha, our level of significance, and we divide it by two. Because I say, hey, with a not equal to, it could be bigger or smaller. So to cover my basis, I'm going to say I've got an almost equally likely chance that I've got a rejection region here or here. So this pair of hypothesis, hypotheses is always a two-tailed test every single time. It's the only time you're going to have a two-tailed test is when your alternative hypothesis contains a not equal to sign. So that kind of clears that up. How about these one-tailed tests? Well, let's go up here and see if I can give you any clues for a one-tailed test. You know how on a treasure map, X marks the spot? Well, in hypothesis testing, remember, remember, alternative hypothesis marks the spot. The location of your rejection region is always, and I mean always, going to be determined by your alternative hypothesis. Because remember, this is what we're going to put to the test. So, you've already got a big clue. Because since you don't have one of these, then you know that all of these are one-tailed tests. How do I know which tail? Watch this. Mu is greater than 67. Whoa. Doesn't it look a lot like an arrow to you? Well, come down here. A mu is greater than 67 tells me I have a one-tailed test in the upper side of the curve. See? It's just an arrow. X marks the spot. When your alternative is mu is greater than 67, it's saying, go to the upper end of the curve. Use a positive value for your level of significance. When you're determining the value that separates the rejection region from the OK region, from the not reject region, if your sign is greater than, it's pointing you to that side of the curve. So, I bet you guys know what's coming next, don't you? The same way that this says I'm a one-tailed test and I'm going to the upper side of the curve, you guessed it, this is a one-tailed test. X marks a spot and it says, whoa, rejection region is located in the lower half of the curve. So, my rejection region is here because we know that this is the positive side of the normal distribution, this is the negative side of the distribution. As soon as I see an alternative hypothesis with mu less than, or p less than, or variance less than, it's giving me my hint to come down here, find whatever my critical value is going to be there based on my alpha, and set up a negative value here for a one-tailed one test with my rejection region located in this lower half of the curve. Remember that because this, 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 and this are all one-tailed 
tests, what do we know about the value of our alpha? Remember, it's only in this two-tail test where we take alpha and divide it by two. In these one-tail tests, all of my alpha, which is basically the probability I make a type one error, is located in one end of the curve. So it's all either up here positive or it's all all right so remember that what I've got is in the case of a one tail test all of in this case remember it's a less than so it's pointing this way it's one tail so a hundred percent of my alpha is going to be here going to be a negative value. If I have a greater than, remember let, let alternative be your guide. In this case, my alpha is going to come here, the upper tail of the curve. All of it's going to be here. It's going to be a positive alpha value because the only time that I'm going to split my alpha in two with a two-tail test is right here. So, these, one tail, these, one tail. The only time you're going to have two tails are here. Remember also that these are exactly the same set of this is the same as this, this is the same as this, um, and I think, that I think that once you know that, you calculating a critical value, calculating your z-score for either a p or your chi-square or your variance is just simply applying the formula. So hopefully this made a little bit of sense. Um, and just remember, when you're setting up your null and alternative hypotheses, remember, you've got to have a shoe. You've got to have a shoe on each foot. It's got to be non-overlapping, it's got to be comprehensive, and don't be out there walking around with one flip-flop on. You guys have a great day, and I will see you soon.